Decoration Corner. This is part two of The Love You Make. Thank you so much for tuning in. Wow, that's an old phrase, but here we are. If you haven't seen part one of this series, please go click on the cards up there. I'll link to the playlist so you can go watch that one. And as more is released, you can keep up to date with everything that's happening. You can save that playlist. You can follow that playlist. Go do that thing and enjoy all of this wonderful, wonderful series. I'm so excited to present you with another episode. We had the best time filming this one, having wonderful conversations. This week we talk a lot about sexuality and sexual harassment, among other things. It was a very, very wonderfully warm room. I'm so proud of this cast. I'm so proud of the work that we're doing in really breaking down the barriers of what we can talk about, who tells the story, how we can talk about these things, how we go about telling these stories. It's everything I've ever dreamed of for this project and more. So I hope you enjoy. As per usual, make sure you're following all of our social medias. This time I'll do a fancy thing and I'll put them all right here for you. So go to that thing. And while you're here, if you're enjoying this series, please go check out our Patreon and support us. Just donate a couple of dollars to help us continue to create the work we love to create and bring more amazing stuff to you. So without any further ado, please enjoy Collaboration Corner of the Love You Make Part 2. We are down a few actors today, unfortunately. Just watch me have to ring for Rich again. Can't wait. Who else? We're really building some great chemistry, though, so it's working yeah. really well. Yeah. And you look like a Rich, so. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much. Um, are you joking? I'm sorry, boss. No. So, the Love You Make Part 2, February 1968, or I'm Surrounded by a Chain of Fools. I'm very proud of that title. Music cue, Draft Morning by the Birds, as we fade in. New York University. Students, young, long-haired, and mop-top people walk through the campus with signs screaming, end the war before it ends you, say no to war, hell no, don't go, stop the war, bring the troops home, and resist the draft. Charlie and Rich appear in the crowd of students. They stand on a bench shouting along. We intercut a video of RFK being announced as a presidential candidate. At the Keel home, Hazel sits on her bed playing guitar as Eddie Adams' Tet Offense photo appears. And we go to the title card, Love You Make, February 1968, Jim stands outside the shop, leaning against his car, smoking his cigarette, and reading the paper. The headline says, it became necessary to destroy the town in order to save it. In the distance, you can hear, light my fire by the doors. In the basement of the shop, Charlie sings and plays bass, Rich plays the drums, and Fred plays his guitar. The keyboard is noticeably missing from the song. Hazel sits on the stairs listening. Valerie makes her way down the stairs and sits beside Hazel. The song comes to an end. Groovy, dude. Encore, encore. Give me 15. I got a smoke. It's coming along, right? So good. Bad love. Val, it hurts me to see you kiss that grease bag. Good. I could take you away from here. No, you couldn't. Fuck off, Fred. Not while there are yeah. kids in the room. Okay. For the 15th time, I am not a kid. Cool. Sure. Uh, we'll have one more go at it, okay? Then we'll call it a day. Sounds good. He grabs his drumsticks and hits the cymbals. Oh, Hazel, your dad's outside. Oh, shoot. Okay. She gets up and runs up the stairs as fast as possible. Goodbye. I'll see you tomorrow, Charlie. Hazel and Jim walk into the house, both hanging up their coats. Okay, I'll start on the vegetables. Do you want to start on the chicken? I can't. Bonnie and I have work to do. Oh. I thought we were making dinner together. Things have come up, Hazel. I, I need to deal with it. I'm sorry. We'll do it another night. Is that all right? Oh. Okay, I'll make dinner then, I suppose. Um, would you like me to call you when it's ready? No, no. I I'll come get some later. Oh. All right. Bonnie comes down the stairs. Jim, there you are. Mr. Lindsay just called for you. All right, call him back. I'll be there in a moment. I'm sorry, Hazel. It's all right. I'll call Evelyn later. Music cue, Judy in Disguise and Glasses by John Fred and his Playboy Band. Fun song. Bright colorful lights, quick cuts between dancers, people drinking, people snorting off the tables, couples kissing in dark corners, everything poised in that perfect campy frame. Dry spell stand on the tiny stage, playing almost in a swirl of smoke and color. Applause as the song comes to an end. Thanks. We'll be back in 15. Fred puts his guitar down and takes off to a booth in the corner where a group of girls are sitting. Rich pats Charlie on the back and heads to Lois's table. Charlie puts his bass down and heads to the bar. Nice job, man. Thanks, babe. Do you have a secret request? A song request? Yeah. 
Any other requests? You'll have to take that up with Charlie. Noted. Do you need a pen to write that down? You said noted. Yeah, fine. Do you need blue or black? Nice set, man. Towards who, right? Her call the guess who, man. Come on. Sorry, CJ. Some people don't know their music. What do you want? Rum and another compliment. Roxy appears and settles into a chair beside Charlie. Walter pours Charlie a glass. I can pay you a compliment. Yeah, give it your best shot. You do more to me than Mick Jagger ever could. That is tough competition. Write him and let him know. Hmm, he's not worth the trouble. Neither am I. Lois settles into the seat beside Charlie and tosses Carolyn's pen to Roxy. For your letter to Mick. <laughs> Who are you? Lois, and you're bugging my Charlie boy, aren't you? Well, I don't think he'd call it bugging. No, but I do. Oh, and who are you telling me what to do? We have a history. So do we. Rich swerves in between Charlie and Roxy. All right, and I'm stepping in now as well, just to make matters more interesting for Charlie. Thanks, Rich. Want to get back on stage, dude? Oh, yeah, got to get back on stage. No, you don't. You said 15 minutes like five minutes ago. You're such a bummer. He's all show, no go. I hate men. Tell me about it. Hey, Walt, another round for two beautiful women, please. Oh, uh, you'll have to be more specific. Us. Oh. Walter nods and begins making drinks. Lois and Roxy get up and walk over to the table with Carolyn and Don. We should have cut out, man. Maybe next time. Lois and that girl seem like a lot cooler than you anyway. So you're probably not missing much. You know, I don't really care about them. No, no, of course not. It'd be cool to be friends with them is all I'm saying. Well, I'm already friends with Lois, but you get it, right, man? Well, uh, I gotta head to CJ, do you mind? No business while we're working, Rich. It's not business. Right. Business. Gotcha, gotcha. You look down, Charlie. Must be Tuesday. Shit, it's Tuesday? <laughs> Man, I had a doctor's appointment today. Oh, I can't believe I missed that. Another one, Walt? Oh, I get it. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, can, t I can take a hit. Yeah. I bet you a dollar I'm not getting another drink. What were you saying? Uh, that I'm the best drummer you've ever heard and you'd be lost without me to guide you through life. I can always count on you to put me straight. You got that right, man. Hey, Walt, refill. Oh, hey, Rich, how's it going? I haven't seen you in a while. Okay, I'm out. Back on it too. Charlie grabs his drink, gets up, and goes over towards Fred. Fred is sitting at a table with some girls, his arm over two of them, laughing and flirting. Blech. A girl sticks a cigarette in his mouth. He takes a drag of it and laughs, but keeps it in his mouth. Charlie approaches the table. Come on, Fred. I'm busy. Give me a few minutes. Time's almost up. We got to get ready. <laughs> no. Charlie grabs Fred and tries to pull him out of the booth. One of the girls falls out of the booth and starts laughing. Sorry. The girl flips him off. Charlie drags Fred away from the table and towards the stage through the tables. What the fuck is your problem? Let me go. I will kill you, you piece of... Charlie drags Fred up on stage and plants him in front of the microphone, then turns around and grabs his guitar and shoves it in his hands. Don't be a piece of shit, Fred. Just do the work. Rich runs up on stage with his drink. You're a bitch. What's going on? We're about to start playing again. This little fucker has no sense of empathy in his body. I'm sitting over there relaxing, chatting, and he comes and pulls me out. Nearly dislocated my shoulder. Jesus Christ. What happened to decency? You said 15 minutes. It wasn't 15 minutes. We have a job to do? You think that just because you started this goddamn band, you can control everything we do? You have no control over me. In fact, I have control over you, don't I? I work under you, right? I can riot and throw you out. That's right, fucking yippee man. Fuck this. I'm kicking you out of the band unless you agree to cut your break short. Now, wait a second, Fred. Come on, Rich. Don't side with him. You know how stupid this is. I'm sorry, but... Fuck you. 
Charlie hops off the stage and starts to weave his way to the tables, pushing people out of the way. Wait, Charlie. Carolyn applauds. Lois glares at her. Rich hops off the stage and goes after Charlie, who was just pushing the door open. Charlie tears down the street with the radio blasting. Today, we mourn the loss of great Neil Cassidy, an icon for a generation who we lost a few nights ago. And he hits his steering wheel. Music cue, green tambourine by the Lemon Pipers. Valerie sits on the Chesterfield, the record player beside her, ticking away. She closes her eyes and smokes a cigarette. Charlie barges into the apartment and slams the door closed behind him. You're early. Charlie ignores her and goes to the kitchen. Charlie, is everything okay? Charlie's leaning against the counter, trying to light a joint, but unable to get the match to light. She stands beside him and offers him her cigarette. He takes it, has a drag, and hands it back. You okay? I can't do this anymore. I know. It'll be okay soon. Let's take a short pause here. Does anybody have any thoughts, things they want to talk about? I'm so sorry, I'm fucking illiterate. <laughs> AJ barges into this room and he goes, I'm illiterate. <laughs> I have to let you guys know that when it said uh, he hits the steering wheel, it took everything in me not to go bonk! <laughs> because that's the sound it made in my head. And now you've done it. Charlie's at the record player in the window, setting up copies of Manfred Mann's latest 45. The Mighty Quinn on the A side. Great song. The bell at the shop rings as Hazel enters. She takes off her coat and rests it on the counter and goes over to him. Good morning. How'd the show go? I'm sorry I couldn't make it. I know I said I might, but dad's coworker was over last night and he just kept talking and talking. I swear that man has no filter. He went off on me for letting my father answer the door. You're at an age now where you should be doing work, he said. What kind of world do we live in where men have some kind of power over women? We're all humans. Why does something completely out of our control decide what we have to and cannot do? It's ridiculous. Anyways, it was an interesting supper. How was the show? It was all right. Just all right? Yeah, well. I'm sorry it didn't go as you'd hoped. Isn't that the understatement of the century? Can't be the worst thing that happens this year. The band broke up. Charlie, I'm so sorry. That's horrible. Don't worry about it. Hazel walks over to the record and puts the needle down. The Mighty Quinn by Manfred Mann. He glances up at her. Turn that off. I haven't opened the shop yet. She begins to dance a bit. He glances up. What are you doing? She takes him and drags him into the middle of the shop, dancing. Dance with me. <laughs> she makes him spin around, gets a little tangled up. They both laugh. He spins her in and out. They come together as if to waltz. You're not so bad at a dancer. Do you want to get a drink after work? Not like the last time, I promise. There are dicks anyway. So are you. Yeah, okay. The carpet man by the fifth dimension plays. Everyone in the club is dancing and shouting. We flash between people snoring off tables again, doing shot after shot, taking pills, making out in corners. Hazel stands in the middle of it. Everything's spinning around her. He appears behind her and wraps his arms around her, getting her to dance a little. She pushes him off. This isn't fun, Charlie. She tries to push through the crowd. Someone grabs her arm. She spins to see Don gripping her wrist. <laughs> Look at you. Let me go, Don. <laughs> no. He pulls her close and tries to kiss her. She pushes him back. He stumbles and falls to the ground, and she runs out of that club. Hazel enters and slams the door behind her. She leans against the wall and takes a few deep breaths as Bonnie runs down the stairs. What's going on? Why are we slamming doors at midnight? Jim comes down the stairs and he rushes to Hazel and hugs her. Hazel, what's wrong? Hey, darling, what's wrong? It's, it's terrible. What is? He walks her into the den to sit down. Bonnie follows and grabs the phone from the wall and begins to dial. I just, I'm so scared. Diana, sorry to wake you. It's Bonnie. Chain of Fools by Aretha Franklin as Diana walks down the street, arms crossed from the cold. She yanks open the door to the groove yard and enters. Charlie leans against the counter, a cigarette hanging out of his mouth, going through records as Aretha plays in the background. So what's going on? Good morning to you too. It's been a while. How are the kids? Me? Oh, I'm rad. Thanks for asking. I got two phone calls last night, Charlie. One from Rich and one from the Keels. Sounds like you had a fun night. No, no, it wasn't. 
Charlie, I'm being serious. Okay, okay. So what's the deal? I'm not your answering service, Charlie. You've done some shit. You need to solve it, not me, okay? What did I do? The door opens again. Hazel enters, all bundled up. She stops in her tracks. Oh, good morning, Diana. Happy Valentine's Day. How are you? Pissed off. Right. I still don't know what's going on. Maybe you need to talk to your friends so they don't come complaining to me about you. We're all adults here, but you're all acting like high school students. I don't care who has a crush on who. We're not high or... school preps, Diana. Don't say it like that. Call I... Rich, okay? Deal with that shit and talk to Hazel about what happened last night because that's a whole other realm. Just don't call me, especially after midnight. Hazel, I'm talking to you too. It wasn't me. It was... I know, I know. What happened last night? Nothing happened. Just, I don't know, it was loud and people were all over each other and you told me it would be fun. And then Don tried to, well, be Don, I suppose. And? I said no. It was loud in there. Maybe he heard go. Oh my God, you're so stupid. Don't call me stupid. Then stand by your friend when she says it was wrong. Yeah, but Dawn would never- oh, wouldn't? Charlie, look at his track record. What? But, but- No buts. I don't need to protect her. I'm not her babysitter. But you're her friend, aren't you? No. What? Yeah, you are, you fool. Show some decency. It's not just what you see right in front of you. And that brings us to Rich. I do not want to talk about Rich. Wait, did we move away from my story? Because I'm not satisfied with that ending. Charlie storms to the basement and slams the door behind him. What a dick. Should I go check on him? Dan, take a slight pause here. Anybody have thoughts, things they want to say on this stuff that has happened now? What's his track record? <laughs> <laughs> he's just a slimy guy i hate him yeah, sorry like... <laughs> i love him i hate him you know i also uh, love it how charlie will. keeps being like hey hazel you want to go out it's gonna be fun and he keeps like ruining her <laughs> no, <night>. yeah <laughs> yeah it'll be fun i'll leave you completely by yourself unattended but it'll be fun yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, a theme. that's such a theme charlie just has a loads of attachment issues man he just <laughs> yeah you know. It's just like, he's such a complex character. I love it. Yeah. Stop smiling, Aurora. It just makes me happy to hear that like the things that I've, I've written are translating well. Yeah, I was, I worked really hard to try and make him a complex character. So like, I'm glad that we're having conversations and, and talking about that. Anyway, does anybody have anything about uh, what's happening with Hazel here? Any thoughts, any uh, things that we want to talk about about that or? Personally, reading the script when we first got it, it was like kind of an icky feeling because I know the feeling that she's been in. I kind of see where this is going now. And I think it's good to talk about these things because a lot of time it's just like, take it, put it in a box, shove it down, leave it. So I'm glad that this is being brought up because unfortunately this is a thing that happens a lot even today. Well, and I'm really grateful that you have Diana really confront Charlie about being like a responsible friend, which I think usually like when that situation happens, it's left up to the viewer to interpret what he should do. But I'm really grateful that Diana gave words to the bystandership that mm -hmm. usually happens. When I was writing this, it was really important to me that it wasn't just like, mm, this happens, leave it out in the open now, whatever, because... Yeah, that happens so often. It was super important to me that we, you know, address this is, you can't just, you can't just ignore this kind of thing. Like we need to be supportive of the people who've been through this sort of thing and who have been in this situation. I think it's good that you're combating it because the Me Too movement and stuff like that happened. It needs to be addressed, even though that I know the Me Too issue has been something that has not passed because it never passes, but some, that movement as a, as a sort of whole is sort of like, passing as we as we go and to plead ignorance by it i think you'd be doing that era and the character hazel a disservice i think because the world that she's getting herself in is 
like that. I okay. also feel like it comes from a like sex positive culture because that was when was, this was first starting. The feminism movement was starting up. So it was kind of like, well, oh, well, don't you want it? So that means that I can take it when it's not really given and that they think obviously here that means that you want it. Whether or not it's your choice, it's something that feels as if it can be taken when it's not being given. The whole sort of like groupy aspect of rock and roll culture and how prevalent the sexual assault and sex was in that is very intrinsic to rock and roll culture and exploring it mm. through this medium is going to be very interesting. I, I'm interested in Charlie and Hazel's journey together, but it's been more interested in Charlie's journey in the sense of like where he goes from this sort of point. Yeah, I think I can see the way in probably in which he's, I'm hoping he goes, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But whether that actually happens or not, I'm going to tune in next week. So well, I, <laughs> love, like, like, you know I, what I, mean? I, I love hoping yeah. for what the characters do and then like being disappointed by the, the like being- Charlie's one big disappointment right now. Yeah. Like, <laughs> that's what he is. <laughs> so it's so written so well to be so invested in the characters just off of like a reading. It's like, I love it. Also, thank you for writing Dawn as the person that transgresses because so often it's not just this random stranger that pulls you into a bush, you know, mm -hmm. it's someone you do know statistically. Mm -hmm. And also thank you for writing her coming into work the next day. Yeah, facts. That it. was a big power move. Yeah, and she's strong. Mm -hmm. I have to say, yeah, like Aurora, I, I'm so glad that um, you didn't fall into the trap here that a lot of other filmmakers and screenwriters, like they, they fall into this trap of they'll just have to show a woman being assaulted to show, oh, well, this is the culture and this is the time, like just kind of using it, just kind of like a prop <laughs> to show, oh, well, this is the culture that he's a part of. And instead mm -hmm. actually confronting it and saying, hey, this was wrong and you need to stand by your friend. The fact that the blame is always on the assaulter and the rapist, but we also have to look at the fact that if I'm taking my friend into an environment that she has never been in before, like I have to look out for her. We have to stick together in this time. I am always about sticking together with my female friends. I go hard for my female friends, my non-male friends. Like I go hard because I'm like, look, if we are in a club together and somebody is hitting on my friend and I can tell she doesn't like it, I'm up in his face, you know, like, back up back up we have to be there for each other mm -hmm. and i love that you brought that out and i love getting to rail on charlie for that a bit i think artistically as well i think uh, we need to commend the fact that you have consistency and the fact of, of, of where the characters are because again pitfalls and traps can come into the fact that like charlie could basically become somebody that you all of a sudden really start to like because you've gone right well they were going to go for a dance that he's actually going to take us somewhere nice this time all that sort of stuff no you've actually done it where his character is consistently a dick right now i think that is good because a dick doesn't change every night do you know what i mean yeah. like, it doesn't so that is really 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 good because that is a pitfall of of writing starting out when people when people start out as writers but again i keep forgetting you've worked on this for five years so it doesn't surprise me i worked with characters like Don before who have had who have had histories and have large problems with um, intimacy who are rapists who are assaulters and the biggest and most important thing that has consistently been brought up is things like intimacy training and dialogues like this mm -hmm. and like this is like right off the bat like I, I I was happy to get this role because like I I can I can figure my way around the character like this, but dialogues like this are very important. And I just wanted to thank you guys for going off on the way. But I also wanted to say that um, I do have a, a background in intimacy training, and I do have friends and peers who would be more than happy to work with us on continuing these kind of dialogues and working in the space, knowing where Don's character goes. Love resources, hell yeah, yeah, Heck yeah, yeah. So I just want to let you all know, at me as a writer. I have made a promise to myself that I will never ever uh, show anyone being hurt, abused, especially women, because so often that is something people go into. My hope here is with a lot of things that are going to happen in this story is that things will happen off screen that we won't see, but will be talked about. And I 
am hoping that we can continue to have these kinds of conversations because, yeah, because it happens all the time. And there are things that have happened <coughs> to myself or people I know that never get talked about and never get brought up. And I don't, I don't want anybody to feel like they need to talk about these, like talk about their own personal stories. You do not need to, but it is completely safe to feel the emotions of that sort of thing because they will come up. I like that you wrote it as it's not like, certainly not an innocuous act. Like it, it, it is an assault, it is a sexual assault that you wrote about, but it wasn't like what you're talking about where there's like abuse and stuff. And I like that because people might think that, oh, if something happened to me in this club, you know, like I can write it off. Like it didn't, re it wasn't really a big deal. And it's like, no, any kind of one of these actions is a big deal. And there's none of them are like ranked, you know, this is the same as that where they need to be talked about it and confronted in the same way. There are so many instances like for my friends and, you know, other personal experiences that like you question, you're like, is that what really happened? You don't really know, you, you, and you don't want to put a word to it. You don't want, um, so just working off what you said, William, it's so important that you showed it in this way or in this because way. there's just so many instances where it's not super explicit, like you might have seen in like, you know, a Law and Order episode or something. So I'm grateful. And Hazel does chime in and has that moment of like, I, it was nothing, he just, it was <laughs> being him. Um, which, yeah, it captured that sort of feeling really well. Thank you for having that conversation. I appreciate it. I appreciate that we are all on the same page and approaching this from a wonderful place. Thank you. I will just let you know, I, I do plan to discuss this a little bit more. If anybody feels uncomfortable, just send me a message or something. I am more than happy to talk to you about it change things. I mean, that's what I'm doing all the time. And that's what this is about. So just let me know. I am, I am here to make sure that we are all also being comfortable and kind. So just let me know. Valerie enters her and her keys down and immediately kicks off her heels. She walks forward and stops. She is sitting on the floor at the coffee table with a vase of roses and <coughs> a Chinese takeout on the table. What did you do? Happy Valentine's Day. Go ahead. Take as much as you want. You're sweet, Charlie. I thought it'd be fun to pretend like we're normal. What's that? I don't know. I love you, Charlie. Music cue, there's a kind of a hush all over the world by Herman's Hermits as Charlie opens up the box of egg rolls. Egg rolls? Hazel sits on the Chesterfield, one light on, the rest of the house dark. She's reading 1984. She hears the front door open and perks up. The hallway light comes on. Jim and Mary are in the center of the entrance hallway, still wearing their winter coats, hats, scarves, and gloves. <clears throat> you know what time it is? It's nearly midnight. I was worried sick. Sorry, Mom. I just met this really nice guy. And he's cute, too. Gloves. We got caught up having a lovely dinner, and then we went for a walk in Central Park. And then, would do you believe it, we got lost in Central Park. So silly of me. I've, I've never gotten lost in Central Park before. Have you, Mary? <laughs> never. <laughs> Maybe that's what love does. Yes, that's enough. That's good. Thanks. Okay. I'm going to go to bed now and leave you both alone. Leave the hall light on. You should call that boy you're seeing and wish him a happy Valentine's Day. Dad, his name is Llewellyn. <sighs> That's too hard to say. You know what's an easy name to say? Henry Price. Now, Jim, leave the girl alone. Good night. <sighs> Come on, let's get you to bed, my dear. He smiles and makes her way up the stairs. He watches her go. He looks down at the drink in his hand and back up at the stairs. No one is there. The lights are off. He's alone. The door to the house opens behind him as Hazel enters. Good evening. Evening. Are you all right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I thought we could uh, make some dinner tonight. I sent Bonnie home early to be with her family. I, I, I thought that would be fair. That is. What are we thinking for dinner? 
pasta, chicken, something else? Yeah. Both? All of the above? Yeah, sure. That are you okay? Of course, my dear. I'll start boiling the water. She goes towards the kitchen. He looks back up at the stairs as Mary smiles back at him. Go. I'll be down in a moment. And she leaves and closes his eyes. <sighs> Charlie lounges on the sofa. Valerie sits beside him all curled up. The phone rings. She gets up and answers it. Hello? It's for you. Yep. I don't want to talk right now. She gets back down for their latest time. I'm with Val right now. What did you say? Everything okay? Hazel stands on top of the counter watching the customers walk around the shop. Charlie makes his way up the basement steps carrying a box. He pushes through the crowd and plops it down beside Hazel. She hops down. The bell of the shop rings as Rich and Diana enter. Am I still rich? I think I'm still rich. Okay. No, he doesn't want to see me die. No, you're right. But he will. Rich and Diana make their way to a small cluster of people and to the counter. Charlie immediately busies himself with the box. Rich, how are you? Uh, yeah, I've been better. Charlie. Charlie walks you in. It's not worth it, Di. It is. Do you know what's going on? Of course I do. Should I know? No, no, never mind. I don't need to know but I'd like to. Charlie, I just want to apologize for the phone call the other night. I, I don't know what I was thinking and, well, you know me, I, that shit's not like me. I, I had too much to drink. I, it was just, look, would you say something? Get out of my store. He left it to both of us. I keep the lights on. With a shot? Is everything okay? Peachy. Ask CJ for the whole story. I'm sure he'd be happy to yell about it for a bit told me about the band breaking up, but I... We didn't break up. Fred fired him. What? Why? Because Fred's a tool. I didn't want to get rid of him. I was trying to stand up for him. I'm sorry. Can I hug you? No. Cool, cool. Basement door slams as Charlie goes down to the basement. Oh, the only thing that could fix this would be the hand of God. Challenge accepted. Sorry, what? No, 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 don't do that. Uh, the biggest possible no. <laughs> Charlie and Hazel sit at a table near the middle of the bar. He has three empty bottles of beer in front of him and is pretty tipsy, whereas she just has a glass of blue Hawaiian empty. There's smoke floating through the air and some psychedelic rock playing in the background. Henry Price walks up and places another blue Hawaiian in front of her. Why, thank you. And he walks away. You like it? It's fruity. Now, the real reason we're here, mister. Sorry, I, I can't hear you. It's too loud in here. Don't be stupid. Oh, shit. That's a strong word. Are you sure you're allowed to say that? I wanted to make sure you're okay. I'm fine. Never better. I don't believe you. Because you're drunk. I'm not drunk. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Can we please talk about you and Rich and- Everything's fine. Go say hi to that waiter you keep buying. No, 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 no. Why not? He seems nice, good looking, works in a bar. I'd call that a plus. And it'll change the topic. I can't, Charlie. He raises his arm to call over Henry. Henry now then walks over carrying a tray of drinks. What are you doing? Helping. Oh my God, no, this is going to be terrible. What can I do for you? This is my very good friend, Hazel. Have you met Hazel? This is Hazel. Yeah, we have actually. Well, he didn't know your name. Hi, Hazel. Hi, Henry. Something's happening. A spark. I can feel it. His dad is my dentist. We've known each other for years. I thought we were pretending not to see each other. You don't tell my dad, I don't tell yours. Sounds like a deal. Shake on it. Are you real? Can I officiate your wedding? No. I've got to get back to work. I'll see you later, Hazel. Bye, Henry. 
Well, shit. I know a lot of people. You should date him. Oh my god, Charlie. I may be made of stone, but I can still sense love connections. Is that how you knew you liked Valerie? Val's a different story. So who'd you sense that love connection with? Other people. Like who? Do you want me to drive you home? Charlie, I just want you to be honest with me. You don't want my honesty. I'm driving you home. He gets up and reaches into his pocket and flings some bills on the table and begins to walk away. She scrambles to her feet, putting on her coat and trying to finish her drink at the same time. Slight pause. Any thoughts, concerns, questions, internal screams? Hold on, I should just speak speech. your feelings, Charlie. Charlie, Go just talk about here. your fucking feelings for the love of God. <laughs> no, I'm a man in the 60s. I just don't do that. Mm-hmm. Oh, masculinity, man. Yeah. <laughs> Very fragile. I have to do everything I can to keep it intact. You know what? Egg rolls are a good start, but you gotta get that communication in there, you know. Fragile masculine. Oh. Hey, hey, for the end of this script. <laughs> I'm so excited. Uh, <laughs> Hazel and Charlie walk down the street in the snow. She's pointing at different houses. That's Mrs. Steele's home. Her and Mr. Steele have been since, well, dad says since the Stone Age, so a long time. Their daughter Daphne moved to California for college and now lives in Oklahoma or something. I don't know. I don't really pay attention. He sticks his foot out trying to trip her. She stumbles a bit, but quickly grabs onto his shoulders. Bitch! Really? And I don't even care if that was rude. Hey, that's my house. Is it bigger on the inside? I can see. No, I should get home. Uh, thank you, though. You'll be okay. Always. Hazel smiles and opens the door and enters her home, shutting it behind her. Charlie looks up at a street lamp and turns and begins to walk away. I appreciate everyone getting excited about the Doctor Who joke. Yes. We'll talk about doctors later. Okay, once again. Charlie is passed out on the counter, snoring loudly, his coat still on. There is a still full box of records resting at the base of the counter, begging to be unpacked. The bell rings as the door opens. Hazel enters, followed by Jim. Hazel takes off her coat and tosses it behind the counter, then nudges Charlie in the ribs. Ow! Morning. (laughs) Charlie, Dad, this is Charlie. Thank you for everything you do for this country. You mean slowly giving into the president's every command and helping the country spiral into economic crisis? You're very welcome. Don't suck up, Charlie. It gets you nowhere. Depends on your career. Fair enough. (laughs) Hazel starts to unpack the box, looks it onto the counter, looks through it. I just wanted to stop by and make sure she got in safely this morning. But I should be off. It was nice to meet you, Charlie. Bye, Dad. Was that because of last night? Yeah, I guess. My head hurts. Is this normal? Yeah, for a lightweight. Hazel gently nudges Charlie. She pulls a record out of the box. It's green tamarind by the lemon pipers. Charlie rolls his eyes. What? You always pick the annoying songs. Pardon me? Listen to that psychedelic twinge. You're telling me you don't like this? It's overproduced. I don't know what that means, so I'm going to pretend you didn't say it. Just have fun, Charlie. I don't know what that is. She begins to dance, sticking her tongue out at Charlie. He smirks and tries to get back to work. The door of the shop flies open as Don and Walter barge in. Charlie, man, you gotta see this. What? Show him the paper, Walt. What paper? The one in your pocket. Oh, that's what that was. Don snatches it and hands it to Charlie. The headline reads, 543 Americans killed in action this week. Highest casualty toll. What? They're shouting outside. You're in for a real treat, sweetheart. Charlie opens the door and yells. Someone yells back. There's more shouting. People begin to fill the streets, shouting. What's going on? Thousands of us are dying, and our president wants to lounge around in the sun. What's going on is a fucking revolt. Charlie throws open the door and heads out with Don and Walter. Hot on his heels, Hazel runs to the window and looks out. A small crowd of young people are gathered around, shouting right outside the store. She goes to the door and flips the open sign to read closed. She goes to the back of the player, then puts the needle down as I had too much to dream, but electric prunes starts. This is another one of those uh, montages. 
She leans back against the display of records and watches as the people outside grow more aggressive and louder. It's very Do you want us to act today? Please do. This is very head-esque. If you've ever seen that movie, that's it. That's it. The sonification of, uh, of, of psychedelia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We intercut between a bar and a street. Charlie throws open the door to the grungy bar, which throws someone against the wall and knocks him out. <laughs> Don hands out pills to everyone. Lois and Carolyn join them. Charlie takes the one they had to hand to Hazel and puts it in his pocket. Hazel turns and nearly bumps into Henry. Oh, I forgot this was coming. Everyone is in the center of the bar dancing. Walter passes a lit joint to Lois. She takes a drag and passes it to Charlie. He passes it to Hazel. She looks at it, takes a deep breath and takes a drag of it. <gasps> she passes it back to Walter and coughs. They all laugh at her. The whole bar is alive, colorful and full of energy. Everyone's dancing around. And then Hazel pins Henry to the wall and kisses him. More running down the street. Charlie stops dancing when he sees Henry and Hazel kissing and he applauds them. More running outside. In the middle of the road, young people stand around, signs raised high, saying things like save our souls, love not war, etc., etc. Lois is leaning on Walter's shoulders. Uh, Carolyn lies on the floor laughing. Don and Charlie are slow dancing sloppily. And Hazel sits at the table watching them as if she's about to fall asleep. Henry comes over to collect the empty glasses on their table. Any thoughts about protesting the Vietnam War? or as I like to call it, fake protesting, because that's what's happening here. I think it's very interesting because we have Charlie who's like so into, they're sending our fucking soldiers over war, but instead of like being out on the streets protesting, he's in the bars. It's an interesting double standard he's got there. Yep. It feels very topical in the current climate, especially with social media and how everyone can write on social media oh black lives matter but then when it comes down to the nitty-gritty of it there's not a whole lot of action happening it brings to mind kind of it has the tone of you know the the musical cabaret yes um which which obviously the the people who went to musical theater school know know that one but it's like the whole idea is you know this war is coming this horrible thing is happening and people are partying and trying to just have a fun time and enjoy themselves on this horrifying, horrifying backdrop. And they're just trying to avoid thinking about it and pretend it doesn't exist. And I think that that's true for like global warming today on a big scale. It's It's been true for like the Black Lives Matter movement for a long time. And that's starting to gain more like, it's starting to be more in the forefront of people's minds, I think, than before that like atrocities committed against indigenous people and all of these things that have just been happening. and we've known about them this whole time. It's not news. It's so much easier to go to a bar and party hard than it is to like actually grapple with how messed up the world is. This whole like tone that this that this episode has and that the whole show has is like really, really speaks to that. My hope with specifically like this sort of thing is they have no idea what's going on. They just say they do because they read the paper, which is the same as just scrolling through Facebook. Or read the headlines, just literally the headline. Yeah. Yeah, don't actually read the article. Yeah. Yep. The the clickbait headlines. Yep. <laughs> Hazel wakes up on the sofa and looks around, squinting in the sunlight. Uh, Riley walks into the living room and places a mug of coffee in front of her. You're going to want to drink that. I don't want to drink anything ever again. Can I stay here for a few more hours? You could, but I doubt you'd want to. Many people have thrown up on these cushions. Did I throw up here? You got most of it on the rug at the door. Oh. You did better than most people. Charlie walks into the room wearing sunglasses over his eyes and dragging his feet. Very weakened at Bernie's. He's still wearing his clothes from the day before. Good morning, sleepyhead. And she kisses him, it's cute, whatever. Coffee's ready, and there's toast in the toaster. Charlie pulls up in front of the house. Hazel looks out the window and sighs. She opens her door and steps out. She rings the doorbell, and the door quickly flies open. Oh my god, where the hell were you? Inside, now. Who are you? Uh, Charlie. Of course you are. Bonnie pulls both of them in, quickly looks left and right outside, and shuts the door. Charlie looks around the house in awe. Hazel follows Bonnie up the stairs. Why aren't you at the office? Your father called in sick. He's sick? Worried sick. Charlie runs up the stairs behind them as they turn the corner and go to Jim's office. Bonnie opens the door. It's her, Jim. You're okay. Perfect. (sighs) Hazel looks over his shoulder to see his desk all clad with papers and empty bottles. Charlie, thank you for bringing her home. Yeah, you're welcome, I guess. 
Why do we all make lunch? He leads the way out of the office in the dining room where a wonderful world by Louis Armstrong plays. Jim, Hazel, and Bonnie sit at the table with sandwiches in front of them. Charlie sits there, not touching his sandwich. And how was your night? Loud and smelly. <laughs> Smelt a lot, like sweat and other things that I couldn't place. Something wrong, Charlie? Uh, no, no, just, uh, yeah, I'm not, um, hungry, actually. Yeah, I remember being young and naive once, too. Go on, eat. So, Charlie, tell us a little about yourself. Oh, um, I don't know. Where are you from? New Jersey. Yeah, I haven't been back in a few years. Why not? I don't know. Not much there these days. Well, you're always welcome in, in our house. Uh, Thank you. The music gets louder, drowning out anything that's being said. They all chat quietly as Charlie looks on a slight smile. Uh, a little later, Charlie and Hazel sit on opposite sides of the sofa. Jim pours drinks at the bar cart. Bonnie enters. Jim, no more drinks. It's for Charlie. I don't care. Bonnie takes the empty glass from the bar and exits the den. He follows her. So, can we talk now? You're breaking up with me? What? No, no, I just... What happened yesterday? Should I just pour my own drink? He goes to the bar. He looks through it for bottles he likes. Stop ignoring me. I don't need the whole backstory. Okay, that's fine. A hard pill to swallow. That's fine. I just want to know that everything's okay. Everything's fine. Business as usual. Not business as usual. Clearly, I'm your friend, and I'm not really. Fine. I'm not your friend. I'm just someone who cares an awful lot. Why did you lie to me about the band? Who told you I lied? Rich. He's got it twisted. I am the band. You get rid of me, the band is over. That's all there is to it, really. You can tell them that for me. I'm not playing broken telephone with you. There's a knock on the house door. Hazel goes to open it. Evelyn stands on the other side, crying. Evelyn, come in. What's wrong? Hazel brings Evelyn in and shuts the door. Jim and Bonnie enter the foyer. Evelyn, dear, are you all right? I'll put the kettle on. Hazel brings Evelyn into the den and gets her sitting on the sofa. Jim follows. Charlie just stares and quietly finishes his drink. Evelyn, what's wrong? What can we do for you? <laughs> They're taking him away. Gregory? Who? Fred Flintstone? <laughs> <laughs> who, who are you? Barney Rubble. Just ignore him. What's wrong, Evelyn? Dad's going back overseas. What does that mean? I mean, I, I know what that means, but what what does that mean? Still medical? Yes. Well, that's good. He'll be away from the fighting. Why does he need to go back? He'll be okay, back. Evelyn. What does that mean for you, Dad? Are they going to call you back, too? No. Arthur offered to go back. Evelyn falls into Hazel's arm and cries some more. Jim looks up at Charlie and nods to the door. Charlie puts his glass down and scampers off to leave. <laughs> Music cue, walk away, Renee by the four tops. Charlie opens the door to the apartment, tossing his keys on a table. Valerie walks in from the bedroom. Hey, Val. How was your day? She what walks over the turntable, takes the handle, and off the record. What, what are you doing? You're going to scratch it. We have things we need to talk about now. We can't put this off any longer, Charlie. We tried to talk about this already and you wouldn't listen. I'm all ears now. Why are you so up in arms? Don't make me spell it out for you, Charlie. I love you. I will get jealous sometimes when you go off Why? and- Why? Just... I don't get jealous when you do anything like that. Uh, Charlie, please just listen. <sighs> you do whatever you want. You're a grown man, your mind is all over the place and I don't pretend I can understand it, at least not anymore. But what am I supposed to do if you still love him? I, 
it's not. You can't say you don't, Charlie. Nothing's happened. Because you said you loved him on the phone. I didn't mean it like that, Val. He's my friend. Is this because he's rich? Val, there hasn't been anything between us in a long time. I don't care, care who it is, Charlie. Why can you say it to him, but not to me? Music cue, Ben Me, Shape Me by American Breed. They stare at each other for a beat. She turns and leaves the apartment, slamming the door behind her. Intercut newsreel of the Orangeburg Massacre. Back at the Kiel House, Hazel is curled up on the sofa reading Brave New World. Who, what, where, when, why plays, and she looks up briefly but isn't invested. At Diana's apartment, Diana sits at the kitchen table with a cup of coffee. Rich leans against the counter, ranting on and on, getting emotional even. Intercut to North Vietnam, releasing three American prisoners of war, two peace activists. Outside the foster house, Arthur exits the house dressed in his military uniform. His family, Louise, Catherine, Gregory, and Evelyn follow him. Hazel and Jim are behind too. A car sits in their driveway waiting. Arthur kisses Louise and hugs his children. Evelyn begins to cry again and Hazel hugs her. Him and Jim salute each other. Intercut the newsreel of protests in Cairo and Alexandria, Egypt, with students being arrested and named. Outside the church at night, Fred faces the wall. Red and blue lights start flashing in his face. He looks up, a bag from under his coat falls, it should say. He reaches down to grab it, zipping up his pants, and tries to make a run for it. Outside Rich's apartment, Charlie knocks on the door. Rich opens the door. They stare at each other for a beat, and Rich lets him in. End of part two. So, that's part I can't believe I got shook again. Oh my gosh. <laughs> So, I was shook the first time I read it, and then I got shook again. So can we talk about the last scene? Because uh, I, I have had this conversation with many, many people, and I, I would like to um, talk to all of y'all about what? it. What? I did not see that coming. What? Uh, I was so surprised, but it makes sense. <laughs> it was. It's that kind of really thrilling plot twist that um, that's like inevitable, but you didn't see coming. And as soon as it happens, you're like, oh, yeah. Why it's do you say inevitable? I'm going to the it, house at the end. <gasps> it, 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 it feels, um, once, once it happens, you're like, oh, of course that happened. Do you know what I mean? But when it's leading up to it, you never see it coming. And then it happens and you're like, oh, that makes so much sense. That explains everything that's already happened. It feels like... Uh, um, but maybe, even still, maybe I think the writing between the like it, it yeah. seems like um, yeah, like I I, I would like have never I seen it coming, known. but it makes total sense. Oh my god, Aurora! Okay, is that why Diana's just like, of course I do. Like she knows what does she actually know what's going on? Does she? Uh, to an extent, I mean, like Rich is one of her best friends, so like she kind of knows what's going on at all points in time. She's also <laughs> just like the person who knows everything. We love Diana. We do, Diana. But TBH, there's not a lot to know. Oh, we're doing this now in the chat. <laughs> it was in the Ruby's listen. coming out on the chat. <laughs> What's going on? No, this actually makes me so happy that this is like everybody. Oh, guys, I'm happy you're all happy because I was very concerned. And Teddy, who is our LGBT rep, and I had a very long conversation about this because I'm not part of the community, but it's important to me because, because duh, I mean, we're human beings. Just let human beings be human beings. It's important to me that this happens because it happens in everyday life. People just are, it shouldn't matter. This is not a, like a coming out story. We're going to blatantly say out loud later on that Charlie is bisexual. It is going to be said. Nice. There will be a blank page and I will say, hello friends, how do we want to say this? The reason why in my email I said, I am so scared to send this is because of that scene. Specifically because it's, I don't want to portray stereotypes or do anything harmful or say anything harmful. So really specifically our friends who are part of the community, what are your thoughts? I think as a bisexual person, this is something that I do face a lot. I'm obviously in a relationship now, but I've been with other people who were hesitant to be with me because they automatically think that, oh, you're bisexual, so you're a cheater. So I think that's something that we'll need to look at carefully mm -hmm. as if to not portray that specific yeah. stereotype. Um, and if we do have to put that in somewhere, play it in a correct way where it doesn't, you know, slap it in your face and go, ha ha, stereotype. 
Can I ask a question on that, actually? What is the reasoning behind them saying that you're instantly a cheater if you're bisexual? Um, it was like a fun like trick. Can I get like three people in a bed together? That's kind of what we're looked at as. And so they could just be like, oh, they're the cheater. They're just a cheater. So it doesn't matter if they're bisexual. I don't need anything with them afterwards. It's the idea that your heart's always going to belong somewhere else. There's mm -hmm. that insecurity that if you're a guy in a relationship with a bisexual girl, it's this like, oh, well, will she always want a woman? I It's actually the opposite for me. I get a lot more flack from women from lesbians saying that I'm like, you know, that like, you can't trust bisexual girls. The idea that bisexual women will always want to go back to the traditional relationship uh, of, the, of like a heterosexual relationship. So there's just that idea that if you're bisexual, that you will not be able to choose. So mm -hmm. there's, there's that thinking of like, well, obviously they're going to cheat because they're only getting one thing here and they like both. Or the trope that like bisexual girls are just bisexual for like attention. Yeah. I think, oh, I think it also goes off. in a relationship with a female because I really like this female. I think it goes mm -hmm. hand in hand too with the stereotype about bisexual people being greedy, which I think is a connotation of like a lot of the things that, that you two have already said about maybe they'll always want to go back or whatever. I think that goes hand in hand with no, oh, like ask, bisexual I, people are, oh, are greedy because they they just want like as many people as they can get when that's really not it at all. I don't sleep with anyone or anything. Can I ask about guys? I'm not, I'm not pulling this away from girls whatsoever, but this was this was a very, very <laughs> female centric sort of like part of the conversation. Guys, I, I'm I'm not a part of the LGBT community either. So this is, I'm surprised that I'm actually piping up in this, but this has made me interested. Like, how do you f uh, find being bisexual? It's interesting. I, I it's, kind of, yeah. I've, yeah, Will, you go ahead. No, no, you started, please. Oh, you already started. So polite. Wow. <laughs> hey. it's the Canadian uh, standoff. I've seen it on all sides. And also, as a, like a bisexual male, I, I've had the privilege to date both. I've had, you know, men, you know, of course, tell me the typical, like, oh, you're just questioning, you're just lying, yada, yada. I have women who will constantly reject me right out of the gate. I've had people shut me down mid Tinder conversation because they read my bio and I have, you know, my written there. It is very interesting because yeah, it's, it's sort of like Sammy wrote there, the sexual deviant stereotype. I'm also, I will, like, I will admit I am a, I'm a very sexually active person, a very sexually open person, but that has often deterred people from being comfortable in relationships with me. You know, I can never get, I can never get past the standard of uh, those sorts of things automatically I'm branded as a, as a heathen and a lot of people have told oh, me like they just don't trust me I like like I can't even I can't even donate blood man like yeah. that's, that's just a bisexual yeah. thing but like that's just oh, one of those yeah. weird little things and it's it's very interesting but you know what I think we're having like again like it's it's a wonderful thing to have these conversations i i'm very straight passing i've been told that before like obviously there's people who can talk to me and figure out otherwise but it's very it's very lovely to see a character like like charlie who is again very who just happens to be like yes it's part of his mm -hmm. character and who he is but at the same time it's not like a a forerunner of his identity you know he's not yeah you know, right around with, like... with stereotypes and ideas, he just happens to be attracted to men, which is very much what the sexuality is for me as well. And you know what, I think we're doing very well with these conversations and hopefully with representation as well, allowing, you know, these queer characters to, to get representation mm. within uh, the media. What you do so well is uh, this framing of Charlie as this like straight romantic lead character who's like very kind of macho um, and, and then you so you set that up for the audience the audience sees him in one way and then you turn it on them and say well this kind of person can be a bisexual person too you know you don't have to wear like plaid button-ups and khakis all the time to be a bisexual man some do <laughs> but not, not all of them do and uh it's it's interesting i really i really find bisexual representation in media so interesting because it always seems to either not exist or it exists in in relationship to the other sexualities more than on its own 
I, and I find that this is this is kind of the the attitude in the dating world too. For for me, a lot of people assume that like if you call yourself bisexual, it's because you're one or the other. You just don't have the guts to come out as full gay, or you want to like pretend to be part of the LGBT community because I don't I don't know. But I, I get I get I get that too. Well, you know, in the 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 Tinder messages of like, oh, I saw in your bio that you're like bisexual, so. You know, it'll be a girl saying like, does that mean that you would rather sleep with guys? Like, I feel, I feel weird because I, I don't want to date a gay guy, you know, and I'm like, but I'm not mm -hmm. gay. And it's also why it took me so long to figure out even that I was into guys because yeah. in high school, you know, I, I was into girls and I, I knew I was into girls. I never, I never was put in a situation where I needed to question my sexuality because I was supposed to like girls and I did. So when I saw a guy or, or like a, a person who wasn't a, a girl and I looked at them and I was like, wow, that is a pretty human being. I really like looking at them. I'm, I, they make me laugh. They make me feel giddy, but like, that's cause I like them so much and they're so cool. And we're such good friends because I like girls and therefore I'm straight period. And there was no, there was no like possibility even for, exploration there which is why i think like bisexual representation in media is is really you know a, a, a positive thing because it it validates it in a way that like there is a stereotype that yeah. like if you're bi you're waiting to come out as full gay and you're just not ready um, it's like the whole stereotype of like experimenting a thing as well exactly yeah. exactly you know like and especially yeah. i think even oh, even more for for girls because for girls <laughs> like the the experimentation of uh like the katy perry i kissed a girl thing is much yeah. more normalized for for girls for for men it's you're you're actually gay and you're just not ready to come out and for girls yeah. it's oh it's just a phase because i think i think a lot of girls who are not bi do experiment with women because there's a little bit less shame around like experimenting with women for women then there is like exper men experimenting with men is a very you have to really want to do that in order to like yeah. go against all of the the imposed like masculinity constructs if i could piggyback off you there i remember i'll, I'll be i'll be vocal about this quote and this is this is a quote i've heard and i think it mm -hmm. really relates well to valerie's character wow i can really tell now that you're into women mm -hmm. and it was sort of this idea of proof that only through like the physical connection that we shared the night before was I actually able to prove to her that I, I did actually have a thing for women. And that, that's a big part of, for a lot of bisexuals is that finding a way to prove to them that they're not moving on and that they're not going elsewhere, but saying that like, no, I'm committed to you just because I have the capacity to love or be with somebody of a, a variety of genders. Doesn't mean that I have to prove to you that I'm going to stay loyal. This is blowing my mind. Yeah, welcome. Absolutely blowing welcome. my mind. I, I just, I don't get it. And I understand that the, 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 this, this day and age and stuff like that, there is a, there is a complete movement and I'm, I'm all for it and all behind it of the LGBTQ plus community and stuff. And I'm really, really glad that now it's one of those things that it, it had to have a staple. It had to have like a thing, like a community sort of thing for it to feel like almost it's normalized, which one, I hate because it shouldn't. Everything should be allowed and it doesn't matter mm -hmm. if it should be a community, whatever. But it's good that there's a progression happening, I guess, to a certain degree. But for that, even within the LGBTQ community uh, to still exist, that that sort of thing, you know, those stereotypes or judgments just completely baffles me. I don't understand it. I just want to jump for a second in to say you mentioned something about you know possibly stemming from from insecurity about like their own sexuality and stuff but I think it's important to also stay away from the stereotype about homophobic people being secretly gay because yeah that's, careful not to cross that sort of line I don't mean yeah I didn't mean uh, oh, yeah, yeah and I'm obviously. not saying that that's like what you were saying but like that can if you push that further that that's where it of course goes. 100 percent, um, yeah. and so I think it's important to to not reinforce that stereotype because <laughs> it can be very harmful you, no matter what the circumstance, I feel like you can never make assumptions about other people's sexuality or like mm -hmm. assume any, because you know, you don't know what someone is unless they tell you, you know, so. Mm. Going off of what Suj just said in the comments and bouncing off what Jay had said, even within the community, there is a significant amount of prejudice 
within certain communities like mm -hmm. you have like the whole bi versus pan butting heads mm -hmm. you have oh, lesbians who are afraid of being with bisexual women because they think they're just going to go back to being with men even within a community that's supposed to be holding ourselves together and being supportive we're dividing ourselves based on arbitrary labels not to say that I, I I'd like it, but it's normalized within a community sense, though, right? Because I mean, Des, I'm going to invoke something about the black community here because mm. I know that th this is a, a thing. Colorism is a thing, and that subdivides things between the black community as well. Am I correct mm. in saying that, Des? Oh yeah. And and I guess it, I also have the same sort of argument within the colorism um, aspect of of this conversation as well that I don't understand where a community should be sort of pulling themselves together and 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 hoping through unity of, of this community that has been created now on behalf of, you know, the, the queer community, basically, that there are still subdivisions. I, that, I, it's crazy. It's crazy. Well, it's crazy. There's it's crazy. Like, like a big example for me is there is a ton of transphobia in the gay community. Yes. There's in the lesbian community, too. It's and, really yeah. bad. It's yeah. really bad. <laughs> it's very bad. Just let people do whatever they want to do, man. That's all it is. Do you know what I mean? Safe, That's, sane, I stand and consensual. That, you know? Safe, sane, and consensual. Fear. Fear is powerful. People mm -hmm. fear what they don't understand. And mm. it's, Who cares if you don't understand it, though? It's it like, that's the, the thing. Well, it comes from, the, it comes from the, the, human, the human need to want to be able to put things in boxes. You know, yeah. humans need to categorize everything. Yeah. And if, if I've worked really, really hard to cement these two boxes that are gay, straight or these two boxes that are man woman and then someone comes and they don't fit exactly what i think this box should fit then i don't know where to put them and that makes me very sad and confused <laughs> and, boxes um, man we're all different shapes so, well exactly so you've got to learn that the boxes are, are a very simplified way of looking at things and if someone tells you they don't fit into a box i think that that's an excuse to for, for you to see them more clearly and to appreciate them more because they they are surprising you and, and they are who they are regardless of whether or not they fit in a box. I think it's, yeah, I think it, I think it makes them more, mm, but that's also not fair to say that they're like more valuable. That's, that's me tooting my own it's horn. Really but I think that like, you, you, you it, it, it means you have something to learn from them is the point actually. Yeah. That's what I mean. It's really a control thing. Listen, I could talk about this all night, okay? I come from a Safe, very yeah. evangelical family. Mm. <laughs> um, and so I know the thinking of both. I was a very hardcore Christian up until age 15. And so I know the mindsets of both. Um, it's very much part of it's a control thing of how you see your world. Mm. It's very difficult if you've been brought up one way to always see these boxes um and when somebody confuses you and they don't fit into those two boxes now everything that you know is up to question and that is scary there's this thing this need to well if i can fit everything into these neat little boxes then everything is neat and organized and there is nothing um, wrong with what i've been taught there is nothing wrong with how i've grown up right? You need to stay in those boxes. It's very much a control thing. And when mm -hmm. you realize that life is fluid and that everybody is fluid and that there's so much more to everything than you know, it's like, oh God, what, what have I been taught? How do I see myself in this world now? Then you start questioning yourself. It's a rabbit hole almost. It takes a lot of courage to be able to step outside of that and say, I'm going to go for the ride and see what this life is really about. That is very, very difficult for some people, especially when you add in culture. These are the things that people define themselves by, religion and culture. How out is Charlie? Mm, mm. That is a good question. Ooh, very. Like, oh, interesting. Cool. He just is. Again, it's not like a coming out story in any way. There's going to be no moment where he's like, and now I'm coming out. Mm -hmm. Everyone just kind of knows, except for Hazel at this point. But like, everyone just kind of knows. Nobody's like wrestling with it. No. No. Because that's. I do have a question, Aurora, um, yeah. about where, in a sense, this is going. You seem to know this era very well. Mm. I love this era. I know at a specific time, homosexuality and the LGBT community, um, LGBTQ plus community was starting to become accepted. 
and then the AIDS crisis hit. <laughs> um, and then, so that's, but that's the extent of what I know of mm -hmm. how society was reacting to this. And also um, the question of legality of these kinds of relationships. What is that like in this era? It was illegal. You could be arrested very much. Uh, it was becoming more accepted among the young community and the hippies and everything as we see in the musical hair for example mm -hmm. but by like the older people people who were more conservative leaning um it was punishable by i don't remember if it was jail or fine it might have been both i can't remember teddy i uh so being gay in the united states actually stopped being illegal as of 1962 but in Texas, it only stopped being illegal in 2003. Oh. What the fuck? <laughs> and um, the punishments were prison time or chemical castration. Wow. Oh yeah. my God. Wow. Chemical <laughs> castration? That's yep. what they did with the um, Nigma guy, right? Alan, what's it? Uh, uh, yeah. Alan, Alan Turing. Oh, Alan Turing, yes. Yeah. 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 So not illegal, but uh, very much frowned upon. And I know, mm -hmm. I know in some places, like some countries, it was, you could definitely, I mean, there's still some places you can be arrested for. Uh, in there Uganda, are places you, you can, can still be, be put killed. To death. Yeah. 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 And if police caught you, it was like, they, they would beat you. Like yeah. it, it got brutal. Yeah. That's why the Stonewall riots happened. It was against mm -hmm. police brutality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is so Actually, true. The first place and it was fully legal in was Illinois in uh, 19, I'm actually looking this of up. all the places. I was like, I know. are you just a pile of no. information? Like, Hello? <laughs> no, <laughs> I have it. <laughs> yep. yeah. Um, and yeah, the last place that was 2003 was Texas. Hilarious. This is a very important discussion. I really appreciate you all talking. How do you want to approach this moving forward? I, I like these conversations. I feel like I feel like you're doing a really, really great job of everything in in this script that isn't directly from your experience you're you're really you've been doing a very good job of, of trying to approach it with respect and of trying to get the perspectives from people like i i very much trust you to tell my story i i know i'm not the only one who feels that way so i i i really value you creating the space for this kind of a conversation because it feels good to kind of be able to be in a room where i can say oh this is cool, there's a bisexual character and like, that's me. And I could, and I could have been in this guy's position in the sixties and this is kind of how I feel about it. And this is how I, I don't want to be portrayed in the media and I can avoid being portrayed that way. You know, that kind of thing is really, really valuable to, to me. Like, thank you for, for what you're doing and just keep doing it the way you, you've been doing it. Cause it's, it's great, I think. Does, like, does anyone else have anything Say? I feel I agree, like, 100%. I like the writer's process should always be like this. <laughs> yeah, for facts, sure. If facts, how, much, facts. how much better media would we be consuming if saying, everyone was like this? Yeah, what do you think about this? What's your experience with this? It, it just, it, I, I don't know why it's not. You literally, I don't know if you've done this by a happy accident or whether this is, you know, completely formulated by some sort of um, concoction that you've done for the past five years, Aurora, but you've completely brought together like an eclectic group of people that have so many opinions and it's actually it's really really nice at the moment we found a unity in that and it's going to be really really interesting if there's if there is some mm -hmm. disparity in that a bit later on that's going to be really really cool but you are combating things that need to be talked about in the open and I think I mean as, 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 a, as a straight man I'm learning things new things all the time and to for this sort of like mentality that some people have towards other sections of communities, other sexualities within communities, other races, anything like that. It's completely mind boggling to me. So learning new things all the time is always good. And we'll always combat red flags as well. I think that if anything comes up and there's red flags and we all go, uh, hang on a minute, maybe we need to discuss this because this needs to, I think mm -hmm. this, it seems like a good group to to, to, to sort that out exactly. with you. I love having the open floor and being, uh, is all being able to speak about our personal experiences and stuff. I do think that taking the lead on the, Charlie bisexual story will probably be like Mateo and Will because that's like their yeah. niche experience. Like I can only speak so much from the LGBT community, I but I don't have the experiences of a bisexual man. Will Burns, how do you feel about the character? I wanted to know because I was going to ask you that earlier on. Um, I've just kind of been absorbing all this. I I I like him. 
<laughs> That's good. No, I think it's great that it's, that. It, it, it's it, it just it's so impressive how dimensional that you've been able to make these characters. It's like mm. like I said before, like rooting for them and then being disappointed in them when they make a decision that you wouldn't make. It's like, yeah. oh man, I'm really attached. And uh, just forming the relationships that they that they that they have and are creating is is something that's going to be just like terrific down the line i i really like henry and he's said like three things so far so i'm <laughs> i'm really yeah, i'm really excited to like dig into him because i know i know he has a whole he has a whole scene with hazel that i'm like very i'm very look i'm very much looking forward to i love henry he's just so adorable henry seems very wholesome he's so wholesome for he, now. he strikes me as uh, as like a lori in little Wayne, now you know yeah, exactly. For now. Oh. oh. Dun, dun, dun. Can I say that, Aurora, though, yeah. the, the way that you're handling these flashbacks with him and Mary is just absolutely stunning. More, I please. remember reading that scene and just going, wow, nicely done. Because it's just, it's how seamlessly the memory of her just slips into the scene. It's so relatable and so understandable because mm -hmm. when you lose someone that important, it is like they're always there in the background. It is like they just all of a sudden you turn to your left at the dinner table and there they are, right? And then they disappear. And it's seeing that and seeing Jim go through that and realizing that he is having his own, everybody forgets that, you know, the parent is having their own tough time trying to reconcile and say that this, my partner is gone. It's so interesting to see him in scenes where he is lively and, and talking to his daughter and talking and he's so heartwarming and positive. And then seeing him in his own little moments uh, getting that peek into his brain of what's actually going on under the surface. It's just so beautiful. And it makes me so emotional. <laughs> it hurts in a good way. <laughs> yeah. So in the original couple of drafts of this, Mary was actually alive and was very ill. I went through grief myself and I went, I would rather explore this than show somebody mm -hmm. being ill. I would rather explore grief than- There's space for that to be explored anyway. Yeah. I'll also say Jim is my favorite character to write and just like putting like these in is just like, oh, every time I come up with an idea for this, I'm just like this poor man, this poor man. <laughs> I'm looking forward to his journey, man. I'm, I'm really, really looking forward to his journey. I'm looking forward to finding out a bit more what happens with him. Does he snap? Yeah. Cool. Oh, yeah. Looking forward to that. <laughs> Not as in the sense I'm like... <laughs> That's such but a great it's, question. It's... <laughs> Because it's, that was a great question. It's coming. Like, yeah. everything's weighing on his shoulders. You're talking about a man that is apparently supposed to be running for mayor mm -hmm. and him having the weight of the world on his shoulders and being completely open to the fact that he knows that he's like he, he's working in a corrupt business and, and all that sort of stuff towards a president that, you know, is, is selling the fucking country down in the bloody shithole. Like, you can see that. And I think that he is very much aware. He's a very world wise guy. Does anybody have anything else they want to say about characters, about things we talked about today, about what's coming? Do you want spoilers? I'm kidding. 